Prophets, Lesson 5, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. The kingdoms of this world will become the Lord's. The small prophetic book of Obadiah, only one chapter, tells us nothing regarding the prophetic call of Obadiah or the length of his ministry, or even the historical context within which he spoke. Who was this Obadiah? Obadiah is a common name in Israel, which means the servant of Yahweh, but nothing else is known about the prophet. His parental lineage, or the town, from which he came. The proposed dates for the ministry range from 850 to 400 BC. It is possible to argue for a date shortly after Jerusalem's fall in 586 BC when Edom rejoiced in the city's defeat. Other prophets also singled out Edom's conspiracy with Babylon. Moreover, the similarities between Obadiah and Jeremiah 49 suggest that the two prophets drew from a common source. Possibly Jeremiah 49 is to be dated earlier than Obadiah because Obadiah contains elements of hope and encouragement, which would be appropriate for a book written in the exile. Jeremiah 49 contains no such element of hope. In 586 BC, God delivered Judah into the hands of Babylon under the kingship of Nebuchadnezzar. The people of Judah were exiled to a strange land far from Jerusalem. Psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, they had reason to despair. In exile, the people experienced alienation from God, the temple, Jerusalem, the king, the priesthood, the land, and all other covenant benefits. A godly remnant, however, did respond to the prophetic exhortation to seek the Lord. They remembered what they had lost, eagerly sought the Lord alone for their salvation, and pleaded with him to restore them as his people. For the remnant, the prophecy of Obadiah was God's answer to their prayers. They longed for God, awaited his love and justice, and wondered when God would judge the Edomites and the other nations. They were also anxious for the establishment of God's kingdom in power, justice, righteousness, and peace when all wrongs would be made right. The message of Obadiah. This short prophecy is directed specifically against Edom for their pride and hatred of their brother Israel. Israel had a long history of rivalry with Edom, going back to Genesis 25, when the Lord revealed to Rebekah that two nations were in her womb. As they grew up, the relationship between Esau and Jacob was anything but peaceful. Their antagonism continued in their descendants, Edom and Israel. Now, with the coming of the Babylonians against Jerusalem, the Edomites boasted about the trouble that had come upon the people of Judah. They collaborated with the Babylonians by entrapping the Judeans as they tried to escape. They openly rejoiced in Judah's trouble and encouraged the Babylonians. Great was their hatred of Judah and even greater their joy 
when Jerusalem was destroyed and desecrated by the Babylonian troops. They had no regard for the miserable lives of the Jews. The fall of Jerusalem was the fulfillment of their national dream, the end of Israel. The spirit of bigotry manifested by Edom during Judah's crisis has no place in God's kingdom. Obadiah portrayed in vivid imagery how Edom had rejoiced, cheered, and feasted when Yahweh disgraced his own people, and how she too would be destroyed without any compassion. God's justice will triumph in Edom's fall. The prophecy, however, should not be restricted to Edom because Edom is representative of all nations hostile to the Lord and to the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Notice how Obadiah expanded the original vision concerning Edom's fall to include all nations. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drink on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. The prophecy concludes with its message of hope for fallen Judah. The Lord promises to restore the exiles and even gives a description of the land and its borders. God's judgment on Edom is seen as a type of God's ultimate victory over the nations. As Calvin wrote, quote, This then is what the prophet now means when he promises to the Jews the heritage which they had lost. Yes, God then enlarges the borders of Judah. Hence, he shows that they should not only be restored to their former condition, but that the kingdom would be increased in splendor and wealth when Christ should come. End of quote. The message of judgment on Judah's enemies was a message of comfort and encouragement for the captive Jews. The prophetic word assured them that Yahweh would save his people and that he would avenge their enemies in God's judgments on earth. They will witness his determination to establish his glory on earth. The nations will no longer desecrate what is holy to the Lord. The comfort of Obadiah. Yahweh alone can and will transform this world and bring order out of anarchy. This transformation is the essence of the kingdom of God. Zion will be exalted when all resistance to God's lordship is put down. The day of the Lord will bring destruction to the enemies of God's children. Any intrusion of divine judgment in the history of redemption is evident that God rules. The godly may take comfort in the hope that human powers will be brought down and that God's kingdom will come with power and salvation. This judgment has happened in the history of Aram, Assyria, and Babylonia as the empires rose and fell. Their fall is to be interpreted not as an accidental occurrence, but as an event of great divine significance. This is what Obadiah meant when he said that Seir, the great Edomite city and counterpart of Zion, should fall, that Zion may rise, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Historically speaking, the relationship between Israel and Edom 
was a complicated one. The wandering Israelites had requested passage through the Edomite territory, but they were refused and had to bypass Mount Hor and go around the land of Edom. At another point, the Edomites permitted passage when the Israelites moved from the Arabah into the mountains of Edom, past Zalmona and Panon to Obot. The attitude found in Scripture toward the Edomites is ambivalent. Sometimes they were to be treated as brothers and sometimes not. In comparison, the Moabites and Amorites were explicitly forbidden to enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the tenth generation. But Edomites were permitted to enter after the third generation. David subjected the Edomites. During Solomon's reign, they created disturbances led by Hadad the Edomite. They fought against Judah during the reign of Jehoshaphat, but were repelled and became a vassal state of Judah. They rebelled under his son Jehoram of Judah, who was successful in crushing their insurrection. Ezekiel describes the relationship as an ancient hostility. Against this background, we must understand the Edomite aspirations during Judah's disaster in 586 B.C. when they said, These two nations and countries will be ours, and we will take possession of them. This attitude is also reflected in Psalm 137.7, where the writer says, Remember, O Lord, what Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cry. Tear it down to its foundations. Later, the Edomites became known as Idumeans. After the Judeans were exiled to Babylon, Edom carved out territory for itself from southern Judah, calling it Idumea. When the Nabataeans forced the Edomites to leave Edom, they took refuge in southern Judah. In the second century, Judas Maccabee fought against the children of Esau in Idumea, and he gave them a great overthrow and abated their courage and took their spoils. Josephus, first informs us that John Hyrcanus was also instrumental in subduing the Edomites, forcing them to submit to ritual circumcision and conversion to Judaism. Herod the Great traced his ancestry back to a converted Idumean. In his book, The Jewish Wars, Josephus describes how the Edomites sided with the zealots against the Jewish establishment and massacred more than 20,000 of Jerusalem's inhabitants, all for the sake of liberty. With the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, the Edomites dropped out of recorded history. Jonah, the great king, is free in his compassion. Jonah, the son of Amittai, lived in the 8th century BC. He was born in Gath Hefer in the territory of Zebulun, about five miles north of Nazareth. We know from 2 Kings 14.25 that he prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II of Israel. In the early ministry, Jonah was probably very popular because he prophesied the victory of Israel and the expansion of its territory to the original boundaries. Thus, the Lord granted a temporary stay in his judgment on Israel by permitting his people an unparalleled era of prosperity, 
under Jeroboam II. But Israel and Judah took God's grace for granted. By the time of Jonah's ministry, Assyria was preoccupied with the mountain tribes of Urartu and did not continue her westward campaigns until Tiglath-Pileser III came to power. Israel rejoiced in the Assyrian preoccupation. She aggressively pursued a policy of defense by strengthening her fortified cities, building up her army, and pursuing international diplomacy. Had the Israelites heard of Jonah's mission to proclaim God's judgment on Nineveh, they would have treated Jonah as a national hero. But they did not comprehend how God was free to deal favorably with Assyria and pour out his judgment on Israel. How unfair all this seemed. The literary forms and structure. The prophecy of Jonah is unlike the other prophetic books. It contains no prophetic oracles and gives no indication of authorship. Though Jonah was an 8th century prophet, others favor a later date for the book's composition. Ellison holds that a Judean prophet composed the work as an encouragement to Judah about to be exiled. Craigie concludes that it may have been composed during or after the exile. Regardless of the dating of the prophecy and the original audience, Jonah is God's prophet to Nineveh, and this book is God's prophetic work. The book's purpose cannot be understood without defining the literary genre of Jonah. Many proposals have been made, and some are very convincing. Is the genre historical merely dealing with an event? Or perhaps is it intended as a good moral lesson? Maybe it is an allegory, a symbolic story, or it could be a satire ridiculing the prophet's weakness, or a midrashic, an ancient commentary on the Hebrew scriptures, or a parable. Van Gimmeren takes the book to be historical with a parabolic force. A parable need not be unhistorical. Its purpose lies in the perspective it offers for wise living. First, the prophet represents the people of God who in their disobedience to the Lord fail to receive God's blessing. Second, the Lord freely rules over creation and delivers Gentiles from their troubles. But God's people may be blind to his greatness and freedom or even see it as unfair. Jonah failed to appreciate that the Lord may be equally forbearing with the Gentile nations as he is with Israel. Yahweh, the great king, is free to bless, to be gracious, and to be patient with the nations. More than that, he can show compassion on pagans and even has a concern for animals. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about this great city? Jonah is seen as a negative version of Elijah. He, like Elijah, was sent on a mission, and when his mission seemed to have failed, he too was ready to die. But unlike Elijah, Jonah had no grounds for despondency. The book makes Jonah look foolish, as Allen concludes, quote, 
Jonah is made to appear a ridiculous figure whose part none would be prepared to defend. The book is a prophetic proverb that draws attention to Jonah's folly and encourages a wise response by the self-righteous. The message of Jonah. Jonah, a prophet of God, was on the run from God. What a parody. The character of Jonah is far from positive. He took off for Tarshish by boat and was asleep during a storm. He did not identify with the anxiety of the sailors. He did not pray for them. He had no pains of conscience about dropping out of God's mission. Unlike Elijah and Elisha, he had little sympathy for the pagans. In the midst of the storm, while the prophet of God was asleep, the pagans were busily praying to their gods. The sailors, in dread and desperation, finally awakened Jonah and asked him to join them in prayer. Jonah, even then, did not confess that he was the cause of their troubles. Not until he was found guilty and responsible for their adversity did he confess. Then Jonah stated proudly that he was a worshiper of the true God. Quote, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The irony in the message of the book of Jonah the sailors' response to the good news that Yahweh is sovereign over creation was overwhelming. They believed that this God whom Jonah spoke has power over creation and judges those who rebel against him. They were more righteous than Jonah because they stood in awe of the Lord. Further, they received Jonah as the prophet of the Most High God, when they consulted him about what they should do. They also demonstrated concern for life when they tried to save themselves by rowing out of the storm. They even prayed for God's forgiveness as they threw Jonah overboard. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh God, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you please. When they had thrown him into the sea, their faith was rewarded. The sea became quiet. The sailors went merrily on their way, while Jonah's destiny remained uncertain. They sailed a quiet sea, while Jonah was in the midst of the sea. Their prayers had already been answered just as Jonah began to pray. They immediately presented sacrifices and voluntary offerings as thanksgiving to the Lord, while Jonah still had to be broken before he vowed to bring his offering of thanksgiving. In this story, the sailors are the heroes of faith, though they knew virtually nothing of God's power and acts in redemptive history. They worshiped the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, and they showed concern for human life and fulfilled the vow they had made to Yahweh. In contrast, Jonah's prayer was self-concerned. The irony of Jonah's theology lies in his limiting God and his narrow perception of redemption. The prophet believed that God is the creator of everything, but that he redeems only Israel. Jonah believed that since God had chosen Israel from among the wicked nations, he had to show mercy to Israel, even if they were rebellious. Herein is one of the book's canonical functions. 
the prophecy contains a strong warning to all the godly. The elect may miss the blessing of seeing God's grace extended outside the immediate covenant community because they impose limits on God. Uh, while Jonah was praying anxiously for his deliverance, the sailors had been tasting the love of God for three days. Likewise, the people of Nineveh, who repented of their sin, rejoiced that the impending judgment had not come. At the same time, Jonah was a miserable man. The book of Jonah affirms God's freedom, sovereignty, and power. He is the creator of everything, and as creator, he is free in his rule. His power extends over creation seen in a storm, fish, vine, and worm, and also over redemption. God can never be bound, whether by a professional understanding, theological definition, or religious practices. Jonah rejoiced in his deliverance and in the protection of the vine, but he missed out on God's delight in saving the sailors and the city of Nineveh, including the infants and the animals. The Lord's proclamation to Jonah that sums up the prophetic message. According to the concluding verses, chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, Yahweh's interest and mercy extend to all creation. This perspective may serve as a catalyst to fulfill the mission to the nation. When the righteous let God be God and open their eyes to his grace and his love over creation, they are free to do God's will. To the contrary, when they bind God to themselves, they bind themselves. Micah, hope in the kingdom of God and of his Messiah. Micah hailed from Morasheth Gath, a village in the low-lying hill country of Judah under the watchful eye of the military fortress at Lachish. He ministered the word of God in both Israel and Judah from 733 to 701 B.C. By virtue of his being raised in the country, he was familiar with the poor of Judah, but he was also at home among the sages of Judah as he exposed the folly of Israel and Judah. As God's prophet, he disassociated the vision of the kingdom to come from the reality of Jerusalem, the seedbed of corruption. With the fall of Samaria, many Israelites fled for asylum to Judah, and we may deduce from the archaeological record of Jerusalem that the city increased rapidly up to four times its previous size. With this influx, her leaders grew more corrupt and the moral fiber further disintegrated. Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah, spoke the word of God in the days of Jotham, Uzziah, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, who were kings of Judah, and of Zechariah, Shalom, Menachem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and Hoshea, the kings of Israel. Both Micah and Isaiah spoke of the fall of Samaria and the end of the northern kingdom, as Hosea and Amos had. But unlike them, Micah and Isaiah lived to witness the fall of the Aramean state under Rezin in 732 B.C., and of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C.
They also witnessed the rise of Assyria, whose empire grew under the aggressive leadership of Tiglath-Pileser III, Shalmaneser V, Sargon II, and Sennacherib. Assyria dominated the ancient Near East for more than a century before being eclipsed by Babylon. Micah's ministry supported the significant reform programs of King Hezekiah. By the Spirit, this godly king accepted prophetic critique and was greatly used by the Lord. A century later, Micah's ministry was still remembered by some of the elders of Judah, and when Jehoiakim wanted to kill Jeremiah for speaking against Jerusalem, they reminded King Jehoiakim that King Hezekiah had left Micah unharmed, even though he, like Jeremiah, had proclaimed the destruction of Jerusalem. Because of this remembrance of Micah, Jeremiah escaped death. The literary form and structure. Micah is largely poetic, interspersed with prose sections. The poetic features include parallelism, wordplay, use of catchwords, prophetic forms of speech, such as oracles of judgment, woes, and deliverance, and prophetic liturgy. The oracles were delivered as commands. Micah made a dramatic appeal to God's people using an extensive stock of rhetorical devices. The oracles resound with elements of both justice and hope. Because the intermixture seemed like a jumble, written without much editing or polish, critics have carried out detailed analysis of authenticity. But the repetitions are effective if understood from the vantage point of the audience. Micah's oracles are best understood as strong verbal or written attacks against the leaders, administrators, and royal officials of both Israel and Judah. The message of Micah. The name Micah is an abbreviation of Micaiah, which means who is like Yahweh. The rhetorical question has the effect of an affirmative. There is no other God like Yahweh. Even the name of the prophet served as a sign of the incomparability of Yahweh. His message proclaimed Yahweh's sovereignty and royalty. He condemned the leaders, the rich, and the false prophets for rebelling against God. They were complacent with their little kingdoms, but apathetic to God's kingdom. In contrast, many of the people suffered and longed for love, justice, and righteousness. The major themes of Micah fall into three categories. One, the judgment. Two, purification and hope. And three, the establishment of the kingdom of God and of his Messiah. The theme of judgment. The book opens with a magnificent vision of the great king entering history. When Yahweh enters into the arena of man, man's environment is destabilized. The phenomena associated with his coming is overwhelming as mountains melt and valleys split apart. This description evokes a sense of awe and wonder. As Von Rad puts it, quote, when Yahweh appears for judgment to cast all human vainglory down into the dust, even their prophets' eyes gazes with delight on his self-manifestation and the phenomena which accompany it. 
Micah announces that their God, who loved them in the past, was coming to establish his kingdom by expelling his covenant people. This announcement undoubtedly shocked his audience, who had expected God's blessing. Since they had violated God's trust by their idolatrous ways, they now could not enter his kingdom. Because they had been loyal to the cultural practices of the nations, cultic prostitution, divination, and magic, instead of being a counterculture set apart to God, they had become assimilated into the practices of the nations. Instead of relying on the Lord, they depended on military advances, alliances, and fortifications for their security. Their society as a whole was ruled by pragmatism. The prophet also condemned their lack of concern for one another. Their insensitivity to justice had resulted in anarchy and had even created serious disillusionment with the institution of the family. The political leadership scorned the covenant and the promises, disregarding God's blessing on their children. The religious leadership was no different because even the priests and prophets ministered in the name of Yahweh for personal gain. Micah proclaimed that Israel, Samaria, and Judah, Jerusalem, would be exiled. Samaria represented the policies of Omri and Ahab, the political, economic, and religious dependency of the northern kingdom on the nations. Those structures would collapse on the day of the Lord for Samaria. Jerusalem, too, had adopted paganism and acculturation as the way of life. The people had given themselves to a self-centered way of life without any consideration of the Lord or their fellow man. This was true of the entire nation. Zion, the city of God, had to fall, even though it was inconceivable to Micah's contemporaries that Zion, with her sacred symbols, could fall. Zion stood for God's kingdom, the Davidic dynasty, and the blessed relationship of God and his people. The leadership felt itself secure and thought only of peace and prosperity. Had not God promised to be with him? How could Yahweh turn against his own? Micah, too, experienced the anguish of these questions. He identified himself with the terror of exile as he mourned and went about barefoot like an exile. The prophet also gave himself to hope and prayer. He had hoped because he trusted in his God. Quote, As for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. End of quote. Unlike his contemporaries, he did not hope for political, economic, or social solutions. He felt alone and cried out in despair, quote, What misery is mine? I am the one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. The godly have been swept from the land. Not one upright man remains. All men lie in wait to shed blood. Each hunts his brother with a net. God's condemnation of Israel and Judah extends to all areas of life. The coming of his kingdom would prove to be not the day of blessing and hope, 
but the judgment and destruction of Samaria and Jerusalem. This is the prophetic paradox. But Micah's vision even went beyond the judgments of Samaria and Jerusalem to all the kingdoms of the world. The day of judgment is God's expression of wrath against all nations when he will appear in judgment to establish his kingdom on the earth. The theme of purification and hope. Micah also held out the sure hope of redemption from exile. The prophet called out judgment. And still he calls today to the godly in every age to prepare for the kingdom of God and his Messiah. Micah affirmed that he and his followers would continue to walk in the way of the Lord, the old way, contrary to the false way of the nations. From of old, God revealed to Moses that he expected a loyal commitment expressed in justice and love. Justice as it pertains to human beings, is that quality of integrity by which one deals with people in accordance with God's standard. Justice is not determined by social status, prior relationship, hearsay, appearances, or likes and dislikes. Justice is an expression of love, which is characterized by consistency, consideration, absence of discrimination or recrimination, and a readiness to cover a multitude of sins and wrongs. As the Lord deals justly and lovingly with creation and with his children, he expects nothing less from them than a spirit that reveals a readiness to forgive, to be fair, and to give people the benefit of the doubt. The law of God's kingdom to which all its citizens must conform involves justice, love, and humility. God's way is always opposed to real politic. Micah's prayer, chapter 7, verses 14 to 20, functions as a model for each generation of the remnant to look for the righteous establishment of God's kingdom. Those who hope, pray for, and work for this new order will not be disappointed. They may pray with Micah, quote, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged to our fathers in days long ago. The theme of the kingdom of God. The rule of God brings blessing and protection to the children of God. The great king promises to take the outcasts and make them citizens of his kingdom. As citizens, they will receive his blessings, live securely, and enjoy the fullness of his promises expressed in the imagery of rural life. Quote, Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. End of quote. The Lord also promises to intervene on their behalf. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. Unlike the leaders of Judah, the great king will establish his rule justly and righteously. Quote, the law will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. End of quote. 
the result will be nothing less than peace as the Lord rules in the midst of his people, protecting them and guiding them like a shepherd. God's kingship will be celebrated throughout the earth and his people will experience his blessing and his protection. God's restoration also consists of the reestablishment of the kingdom under the Davidic Messiah. Micah confirmed God's promise to David, but not without transforming the human conception or expectation. He disassociated the messianic reign from Jerusalem because Jerusalem had been tainted by the corruption of power, immorality, foreign influences, and idolatry. He purposefully associated the Davidic Messiah instead with Bethlehem. Quote, You, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from ancient times. End quote. The Davidic Messiah will truly accomplish the will of God on earth. He will establish the kingdom of God, deliver the children of the kingdom, restore the full enjoyment of the promises, blessings, and covenants to them, vindicate their rights, and avenge the oppressors. He is a warrior sent by the great king to fight their battles. The messianic kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom in which the Lord will cleanse the earth of all immorality, idolatry, power play, and corruption. The kingdom will be the Lord's, his Messiah's, and that of the people of God. They will forever enjoy the presence of God in protection and blessing, being filled with the goodness of the divine warrior who cares for the remnant and for his creation.